Thank and you. We Thank move, you so much. We move to the second speaker, who is Mattia Ponte. Mattia, uh, here he is. He got his PhD at Naples University, Federico II, under the supervision of Mario Nicodemi. He is now a postdoc researcher at the Max Delbruck Center for Molecular Medicine in Berlin. His research activities are mainly uh, applications of statistical mechanics to molecular biology. He works uh, in a very wide uh, network uh, with uh, units uh, from different places in the world, Oxford, Lyon, uh, in Europe, uh, and also in the States, Harvard, Stanford, and others. And today he will give a, a talk uh, um, whose title is Polymer Physics and Chromosome Spatial Organization. You can you can start, Mattia. Yes, thank you very much for the introduction. Can you see the full screen and also my arrow moving? Yes, yes. Okay, great. So thanks again. And uh, actually now I am a postdoc again in Napoli at University Federico Secondo, working with Mario on uh, many exciting projects. And as I try to highlight in the title of my talk, the topic today will be uh, the application of models from polymer physics to try to understand the mechanisms that underline the organization space in the nuclear space of, of our genome and chromosome. So I will take, say, on the biological side of statistical mechanics. And uh, first of all, be before going in this direction and so showing you the, the models and our polymer approaches, I want to uh, just recap some very basic concepts of DNA molecular biology, uh, starting from, say, latest discoveries in this field, because uh, uh, recent discoveries have made clear that DNA is not just a linear sequence. So it's not just a one dimensional uh, a sequence of letters, technically called buses, that make up our genome. Actually, now we are understanding quite clearly that DNA is a complex three dimensional structure, and the way our genome is folded in 3D space is crucial, is essential to accomplish uh, many biological processes and functional activities, such as, for instance, the regulation of the genes. And uh, in this respect, I just want to discuss and describe uh, the emerging picture of gene regulation, and this connection with the 3D structure of the genome as exemplified in this simplified cartoon in the middle of the slide. So as you can see, along the chromosome, chromosome filament that I uh, drawn in, in blue in this slide, there are some specific regions that are called genes, which contain the genetic information for producing the proteins, which are essential for the functioning, as you know, of, of the cell. But uh, along our genome, so um, along the uh, chromosome filament, there could be also other sequences that are not genes, and they are colored in green, for instance, in this cartoon, which are called the regulators. And the idea is that uh, those sequences can uh, activate a distal gene by establishing a physical contact in space with the gene itself, so by looping onto the gene. And the striking thing is, that typically those regulators are very far along the uh, chain with respect to their target gene, because on average they could be, for instance, also one megabase away, which means one million of bases, one million of letters away with respect to their target gene. And so one possible question is, uh, how is it possible that those regulators in the crowded nuclear environment can identify distal target gene and uh, activate this gene by establishing a physical contact? So the question is, what is the mechanism that underlines the formation of those functional encounters between gene and regulators? And uh, also, of course, this is not happening only for one cup, one pair, if you want, of regulator in genes, because we have 20,000 genes in our genome. You can imagine how complex is the network of the contact established by them. So uh, before going in this direction, so what is the principle, what is the mechanism underlying the formation of this contact? I want to discuss the quantitative data coming from real experiments that nowadays are available, for instance, on those encounters between gene and regulators. Because if we want as physicists to build up some predictive, hopefully predictive models from physics, first of all, we need quantitative data from experiments and we need to understand that. Uh, so, uh, I, I just want to stress that in the recent years, so you can see from those references here, in, in the last 10, 11 years, there have been major advances in the field of uh, uh, molecular biology, whereby nowadays we have quantitative technologies such as IC, but also many others, that can measure the frequency, so the probability of the contacts between two any pairs of sites along a chromosome, but in general, uh, along all, all our chromosomes in the, in, in, uh, say, in the nucleus of the cell. 
Of course, without entering into the details of this technology, I want to discuss the typical output of this kind of experiment. I see experiment because this is super important to understand how we can uh, build and produce quantitative models to understand the mechanisms underlying. So what you see in the middle of the slide is the typical output of a IC experiment. This is a pairwise contact matrix, so a matrix of contact in this example of the human chromosome 14. On the x-axis, you just have the genomic coordinates of the chromosome that you're considering, in this case, the number 14. And again, on the y-axis, you always have the, the genomic coordinates of the same chromosome. Each entry, or if you want each window of this matrix, measures how many times two sides of the chromosome, for instance, the red sides and the green sides in this example, are found close to each other across a population of identical cells. Where close to each other means that they are uh, physically close in space, so their spatial distance is something like 100 nanometer or even less, which are the typical number of um, contact threshold in real experiments. Now, what is quite impressive, and this, this is one of the striking uh, things that uh, people notice when you look for the first time to these matrices, is that, uh, as you can see, there are specific patterns of interaction that extend through all the length scale of the chromosome. So, in other words, if the contacts were random in the cell nucleus, I mean, uh, of course, the red and the green side would have the same probability of inter interaction of to any other pair of sides. So this matrix should should be like a, a uniform matrix, okay, with the same level of contact frequency everywhere. Instead, uh, on the contrary, you can see that there are specific blocks of contacts because there are some regions, like the one I'm highlighting here in, in red, uh, which have strong contact frequency, much higher, for instance, of those other regions where contacts are much more depleted, and so they are covered in, in white. And those patterns, as I said, extend through all the 100 megabit scale of the chromosome. Also, what is even more interesting is that if you take a zoom within this map of contacts, so you take a shorter sub-region of the entire chromosome, two order of magnitude shorter, you can see that those contact patterns are still there. They are still observed. For instance, this blue region tend to strongly interact with itself and less with the other domain. So the, the great finding that has been made in this field in molecular biology in the last 10 years is that our genome, so the human genome, our chromosomes, are folded on this scale, the mega base scale, which is the typical length scale of the interactions between gene regulators, is folded into preferential blocks of interactions, which are called technically topologically associating domains, or TAD. Of course, as you understood, the TAD are just the beginning, the initial step of a, uh, the initial, if you want, basic structure of a much more complex hierarchical organization spanning, say, as I said, all the landscape of the chromosome. And so the message I want to stress in this slide is that now we have quantitative data from real bio molecular biology experiments on the contacts between gene regulators, but much more in general, between 20 pairs of sites in the genome. And the emerging picture is that our chromosome have a complex pattern of interaction, which is a proxy of the complex spatial organization of those chromosomes in the nucleus of the cells. Okay, so finally, now we can go, uh, we, we can tackle, I mean, the, the, the question that maybe is interesting for us as if this is, that is uh, how the system works. So in other words, what is the origin underlying the formation of those contact patterns? What are the mechanisms that shape the formation of those contacts? Uh, say, our approach is the following, because at the end of the day, DNA is a polymer, is a very long molecule. And so uh, we want to use principled approaches from polymer physics to try to understand and dissect the putative mechanisms that are likely to shape the origin, the formation of those patterns of interaction. Of course, this big question uh, can be uh, posed at a much more fundamental level in understanding how two distal sites, for, for instance, regulator and gene, can be uh, brought into close partial proximity. And uh, the scenario that we proposed is uh, summarizing this simplified cartoon in the top of my slide, because we had in mind a very basic biological scenario of DNA contact formation, which I will try to explain. So if two distal sites, as I said, for instance, A, B, or regulator and gene need to establish a physical contact, for instance, that could be accomplished because there is a particle, which means a molecule or a protein in the nuclear environment, which can bridge those distal sites, so bringing those sites together. Uh, we try to, uh, I mean, base our model on this basic scenario of DNA contact formation, but try to uh, develop, rely on these a, a quantitative uh, models from polymer physics, which we called the strings and binders, or shortly the SBS polymer model, because the basic ingredients of the model are just the polymer string, as you can see, 
at the binders that are nothing more than those particles that can bridge distal sites together. Uh, in the strings and binder or SPS polymer model, a chromosome filament or a chromosome region is represented as a polymer chain. Technically speaking, this is a self avoiding work polymer chain, uh, which is made of beads or, or monomers, which is the same. And as you can see, all along this chain, there are specific binding sites highlighted in red in this cartoon, which are the binding sites for those floating Brownian binders. And the idea is that the binders can recognize the cognate sites on the chain. And so by attractive cell energons like attractive potentials, they can uh, loop the polymer by mm, say bridging together the red sites on the, on the polymer chain. Uh, now, what is known in polymer physics is that um, this type of system, this type of model does not fold in equilibrium in, in any possible conformation because the equilibrium states, the equilibrium conformation of this polymer model just fold in a few conformational classes which correspond to the emerging thermodynamic phases of this kind of model. And so to be, to be a, a bit more clear, um, I can try to describe the phase diagram of this toy SBS polymer model I'm considering now. Uh, the phase diagram is mainly controlled by two parameters that are respectively on the x-axis, the binder concentration, so the number of those binders around the polymer, and on the y-axis, the energy affinity or the chemical affinity of those binders, again, uh, say, toward the red binders of the, uh, the red beads, sorry, of the polymer chain. And this energy is measured in KBT unit. This is the typical length scale of the the typical scale of the weak biochemical energy um, scale, so a few kBT unit, in other words. And so the idea is pretty easy to understand because if you have just a few binders around the polymer or the energy of those binders is not enough, so the, those binders are uh, say, too weak from an energetic point of view, of course, the binders do not manage to stably fold the polymer that uh, prepares for entropic reasons to stay into a much more open, randomly folded state, which is called the coil phase of the theory. And this can be shown that uh, can be mapped in the self-avoiding world universality class. So it's a randomly folded polymer model. But if you increase the number of the binders or the energy affinity of those binders, as you can see, there is a precise threshold above which the binders do manage to stably fold the polymer into a crumpled, uh, compact, closed conformation that is the globule phase of the theory. So in other words, this polymer model undergoes a thermodynamics phase transition from a coil to a global state, the well-known coil to global phase transition of polymers. And so this means that uh, in our model, by determining the thermodynamics phases of the system, which can be predicted by using physics, we can derive from first principles, the ensemble of conformation where the system spontaneously falls into. And uh, why this should be important from a biological point of view? Because uh, since everything is based on the concept of phase transition, this means that, that to control the conformation of chromosomes of, of our polymers, we don't need to make any molecular fine tuning because we just need to stay above or below the threshold line. So with the, with the eye of mind, this would, would mean that uh, uh, the cell, the real cell with the simple strategies, uh, which are up-regulating or down-regulating the production of those binders can control in a switch-like manner the folding of the chain. Okay, of course, this is a toy model I'm discussing, it has nothing to do with the real genome, but supposed to take it seriously for a couple of slides, because we can now try to consider a slightly uh, much more sophisticated or basic variant of this polymer model toy I discussed so far, because now we can try to specialize the type of, types of binding sites on the polymer chain. So we can consider not only the red binding sites, but we can add also in the other part of the polymer, some green binding sites. Again, uh, we put some red and green binders. It, the idea is that we can allow only homotypic attractive interactions between the same colors. So the red binders can only bridge the coconut red sites on the chain. And the green binders as well can only bridge their cognate green sites on the chain. So if you simulate this system, for instance, by molecular dynamics and other techniques, the typical equilibrium conformation of this polymer model will be something like that. So the, the polymer at equilibrium spontaneously uh, will fold in two segregate globules, one enriched in the red phase and the other in the green phase because of the local abundance of cognate, say, red or green binding sites. And so if you take the map of the contact of this polymer model, where on the x-axis and y-axis, you just put the, the coordinate of your polymer, uh, you will see a pattern like this one, because of course you may expect that there is an enhanced block of interaction between the reds, an enhanced block of interaction uh, between the green. And so you have two square blocks of interaction that at least visually resemble the real contact pattern, say the TADS, for instance, that 
biology school in this way from real biological experiments. So to cut short a very longer story, uh, this mechanism, this process to form contact envisaged by polymer models such as our strings and binders and also other falling in the same universality class is a mechanism that is called polymer phase separation or micro phase separation in the literature. Because as you can see, the system, in this case, the polymer, spontaneously self-assembles into distinct globules, so phase separate into distinct globules because of the local abundance of cognate binding sites or homotypic uh, interactions. Uh, but I don't want to give the impression that this is just qualitative and this is just a model because um, you understood that uh, if we consider this process of phase separation, but we consider now much more sophisticated polymer models. So SBS polymer chain with distinct types of binding sites. So with multiple types of colors, in other words, on the polymer chain, we can quantitatively make sense of the data. And in this slide, I'm just want to discuss uh, an example of some applications that we made in this uh, in this sense. Uh, you can see on the top, uh, you see my area, just a six megabase wide chromosome region around the FF4 gene, which is a super important gene because it's involved in uh, several biological processes, such as also embryo development and so on. So the map that you see on the top, this matrix, is the real map of contact of around this gene as measured in a real, say, IC experiment, where you can see specific uh, interactions, uh, specific enrichment of contacts around the gene, some more fleeting interaction here, and so on. And the matrix that you see at the bottom is the one that we derive in our model by using, of course, much more complex polymer model, but with the same mechanism of phase separation or micro phase separation I discussed before. And so the message is that uh, we can capture the complex architect architectures uh, of, of real chromosomes as measured in real data uh, by considering multiple types of binding sites. And we can quantitatively reproduce those data. Uh, of course, there are a lot of technical pending issues that I'm not tackling. For instance, uh, how many colors you need to explain real data and how you choose those colors? What is the meaning of those colors? Uh, I will try to quickly address some of them. Uh, because to infer the polymer model that best explain the data, we develop a, a machine learning procedure that is called PRISMA, uh, the acronym is for a polymer recursive statistical inference method. And uh, PRISMA basically works in this way. The pipeline is summarized in this uh, ca cartoon in the, in the uh, middle of the slide. So the idea is that we take as input the real contact metrics, the, say, I see experimental contact map for a given genomic region or for an entire chromosome that we want to study. Then we start with a zero polymer model, which means a polymer model with a random assignment of colors. And we compute at this zero stage, if you want, the contact map with the physics of phase separation of this zero polymer model, which then we compare against the input. Of course, at the beginning, the agreement is not good because we started with a random assignment of colors. And so for this reason, uh, we start an iteration uh, whereby uh, step by step, we change the colors of the bits of the monomers on the polymer chain. And each iteration step, we compute the contact map with the physics of phase separation that we compare against the input. And we iterate this procedure until we get the minimal set, which means the minimal arrangement, the minimal number of colors in their positioning along the polymer chain in order to best explain the IC contact data, the uh, experimental contact matrices that uh, uh, we want to study. So if I come back to my previous slide just for a second, uh, this means technically that we are fitting the data because we are taking as input, say, the contact matrices and with the prisma and the phase separation, uh, we are inferring the best polymer model in order to explain the input. Now, on the one end, this is not trivial because it's not trivial that the mechanism of phase separation is consistent with the data can explain the data. But at the end of the day, on the other end, it's a fit. Uh, so in the remaining part of my talk, I just want to show you that actually we can do much more than a simple fit because we can test our theory by making predictions that can be tested against uh, uh, independent data. Sets. So we can validate also this mechanism of phase separation um, well beyond a simple fitting of the data. So one way to make a test of the theory, we had many applications in this sense, I just want to discuss one of these. One way to test the theory is, for instance, by implementing some mutations, so some perturbations of the polymer chain uh, that we can compare against independent data, and I will try to explain now uh, with more detail. So, so suppose to take your polymer model in the normal condition, so for a given uh, chromosomal region that we want to study. 
then we can perturb this polymer model, for instance, by implementing, a, say, a deletion, which means that we cut out a piece of the polymer, for instance, this piece of the polymer between the yellow monomers that I'm uh, highlighting here in this cartoon. And then, out of your physics, we can predict how the system refolds in space after this deletion. So what is, for instance, the map of the contents predicted by the theory after this deletion? And ideally, we can match uh, our prediction, they compare our prediction against independent data, so for instance, against an independent experiment performed on a real human patient that carries precisely the deletion that we are implementing or considering. Of course, I mean, the prediction of the theory will be simply confirmed or rejected because there are no available fitting parameters. So in this sense, this is a way to stringent test the predictive power of those types of models. And again, in this slide, I'm just showing, I want to discuss quickly an example. On the left-hand side, there is nothing new because the example I want to discuss is again around the FF4 gene. On the left-hand side of the slide, you just see the comparison between the model and the experimental map of contacts, which is one I discussed a couple of slides ago. And the new things I want to discuss are here on the right-hand side, because uh, here it's interesting and it's what happens, what is predicted by our model when a mutation, a specific mutation is implemented. So, uh, as you can see in, in our model, in this case, we uh, deleted this region that is, uh, I hope you can see, is highlighted in a gray shaded box. And we deleted this region around the FF4 gene. And what you see on the top is the map of contents predicted by our theory after this deletion. Now, immediately you can see that this map is different from the normal case without the deletion because there is a new specific cloud of interactions, which is this one, uh, that is absent, of course, in the normal or as biology say in the wild type case. Now, this area, this new uh, predicted uh, cloud of interactions is particularly interesting because uh, uh, it represents the new interactions arising from those uh, regions that I highlighted in blue in this, in this slide. So in particular, this region is called the answer. This is a regulator of the FF4 gene. And this other guy, Pax3, is another different gene. So in a nutshell, the model is telling us that after the deletion around the FF4 gene, uh, the regulator of FF4 interact with the wrong gene, with another different gene, Pax3, causing its activation. And so this new cloud of interaction, which is not expected in a normal uh, case, uh, our colleagues in Berlin at Max uh, Planck Institute and others, they perform uh, in, an independent IC experiment on a real human patient carrying precisely this deletion around the FFO gene. And that was quite surprising and striking for us. They found the same patterns of uh, unexpected ectopic interactions that was predicted by the theory. And maybe the two messages I want to stress in this slide are the following. Uh, one, those types of studies basically reveal the uh, predictive power of those models. I mean, on the one hand, we are validating those kind of approaches. It's also this underlying mechanism of phase separation because we are making some predictions that we are testing against, a, uh, if you want, independent that data. But on the other hand, what, what is even much more interesting and um, ambitious for us in a biomedical perspective, this means that with, with basic concepts of polymer physics and with those type of tools, we can predict in silico how this, the network of contacts between gene and regulator changes after a mutation or a perturbation. And as you understood, those mutation are not random because they involve gene of regulators. So in sometimes they are often linked to disease. Indeed, the human patient where the experiment was performed on, it was affected by a congenital disease called the brachydactyly, which is, as you can see in this cartoon, a kind of malformation of the fingers of the end. So the big message is that we can predict in silico uh, the effect of a disease associated perturbation mutation on genome 3D architecture. And this is the last chapter of, of the talk. Uh, because uh, so far we just compared the, the model and what the model can do at the level of the average interactions, if you want. Because as I told you before, uh, the high C experiment, as well as many others, are experiments performed on a population of cells. So the matrices that you see represent the, the, the population average contact frequency. So what do you expect averaging the contacts over a population of, say, thousands and thousands of identical cells? So depending on the open question is what happens in single cells, so beyond the average interactions, what the model can say in that case and how chromosomes are folded in single nuclei. Uh, this question makes particular sense today because in the last five years, 
there have been major advances in the field of microscopy, whereby nowadays, thanks to super resolution microscopy or imaging techniques, uh, people can measure the structure. And so the maps of interactions I discussed before at the level of the single DNA molecule, so in single cell, not only on average. This is super exciting for us as a physicist working in this field, because this means that we can test our model at the single molecule level. So for instance, we can take the single structures coming from a real microscopy experiment, the single polymer conformations predicted by the theory and see whether they match or not, because they will give insight on the folding mechanism in single cells, as I said. Um, I don't have the time to go through the details, and so I just want to uh, share with you the, the main messages and the big picture. Uh, for instance, uh, this is just an example. We modeled a region on chromosome 21 in this cell line. It's called HCT116. It's a cancer cell line. Uh, you can see here where I'm pointing my arrow that the average pattern of interactions expected for this uh, uh, chromosome is observed in a real microscopy experiment. So this is experimental data. And below you can see what the model predicts in this case. And so we know that at the bulk population level, we can uh, quite well explain the formation of contacts and uh, contact domain and so on. The new things are in this column because uh, uh, you can see that, for instance, this matrix is the map of the interactions measured in the experiment for a given cell, for one cell, so cell number one. You can see cell number two, another example, another cell, where the, there is another specific pattern of interaction at a given time. Uh, what we did in a nutshell was to make a rigorous all against all comparison between the experimental 3D conformation, those are measured in the experiment, and to compare them against the single polymer structures predicted in our ensemble, thermodynamics ensemble of polymer conformation. And uh, what we show uh, is that in a statistically significant way, we proved, we demonstrated that the conformations coming from the theory were a statistically significant uh, representation of the chromosome conformations as observed in this multiplex fish experiment or simply microscopy experiment. Just to give you the visual idea, for instance, this is a single cell conformation. This is the map of interactions in one cell. And you can see below the one of the best match, the corresponding best match predicted by the theory. And this was a prediction, not a fit. I can provide you much more detail later if you are curious. And the, uh, this is another example of best match confirmation. So just the main message I want to stress is that uh, we show that this thermodynamics process of polymer phase separation can explain the formation of contact at the level of the single molecule level. It has been validated against super resolution microscopy data. Um, I don't have the time maybe to discuss this last point, that is what is the molecular nature of binding factors? What is the meaning of the colors of the theory? And yes, the answer is that- uh, You have three minutes left. Three minutes, okay. Yeah. So maybe quickly, I can just say that uh, uh, one open question that I didn't ta uh, tackle so far is what, what is the meaning of, of the colors that we have on, on the polymer chain? Uh, for instance, this is the distribution of the colors in the model I discussed before of this chromosome region. And uh, what we showed is that, uh, um, for instance, the, the green color, as well as the red, the yellow, are not associated only to one specific binding molecule, for instance, one specific protein. But each of those colors, as we shown in recent paper, is associated to a specific combination, uh, to a specific code of proteins, histone marks, and transcription factors, and so on. I, I know that this is maybe quite technical, but the idea is that this polymer phase separation is driven by real molecular agents. And in some cases, we identify precisely those molecules. And the idea is that uh, there is a combination of proteins and factors involved in, the, in orchestrating the 3D structure of the genome that we identified in some cases. But I know that this last point could be a, a bit technical. So I just want to conclude and wrap up uh, just by saying that uh, to identify the origin of the contact patterns as observed in real crumbs of data, uh, we, we use and we want to use principal approaches from polymer physics to understand, say, the, the mechanism that shape those uh, folding patterns and so on. Um, we have quite strong evidence that a thermodynamic process based on phase transitions, in particular on this mechanism of phase separation, can control, of course, it's not the only one, but it's maybe one major driver that can control the, the architecture of chromosomes at the level of the single DNA molecule, so in single cells. And finally, uh, of course, once we have validated quantitative polymer models, uh, we can use them to make useful, say, real-world applications. Um, for instance, uh, I just mentioned 
but we explore many different applications of our models. For instance, I mentioned that uh, we can predict in silico uh, with our tools how a mutation can alter the 3D configuration of the genome. And those mutations, as I said, are not random because they can involve genome regulators. So sometimes they are disease-associated mutation. And this means that with those basic concepts of physics, we can understand the disease-causing potential of many uh, say, pathologies, such as, for instance, structural variants, congenital disorders, and, and so on. Um, now, I want to thank all uh, people with whom I'm working. So, uh, I work, so a special thank, of course, is for Mario and all my colleagues in, uh, in Napoli. Also, thank is for my former colleagues in Berlin, where I spent a postdoc there last year. And finally, also colleagues in the US and uh, in France, in Giacomo Cavalli Lab. And of course, thank you all for listening, and I hope to be on time with scheduling. Okay. Thank you, Mattia. Any question? Yes, oh, there are. I see 14. Uh, no, it's th maybe it's three, depending. <laughs> <laughs> 17, it changes. OK, it can, seems can the first is Giancarlo Francese. Yes, uh, hi, nice talk. Hi. Um, why do you say that is a phase transition? It, it, it reminds me protein folding somehow. And we know that in protein folding, we don't need to uh, use the phase transition concept to describe it. It's, it's a structural change. So why not just a structural change also in your case? Okay. Yeah, yes, actually, uh, I mean, without the phase transition, uh, this is the, 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 the main concept that, that we have in mind. Uh, that uh, differently from protein folding, where there is only one native, naive, if you want, structure, in the case of genomes, in case of DNA, there are multiple confirmations. There is not only one naive structures where, say, the system tend to. And what we found is that uh, uh, this phase transition can both explain some open, say, confirmations that are actually observed in real genome, for instance, when you deplete some uh, molecular agents like quasi, and also some wild type conditions that are much more if you want better mapped in the globular phase. So it's uh, this differential structure that you see in the coiling globule uh, belongs to different, in real different thermodynamic spaces. So our idea is that the genome in the cell lives in different thermodynamic states. In some cases, for instance, when you deplete some molecular agents like lysine, it's much more a coil, randomly folded conformations. In other cases, in the white type case, is a globular state. And also what we showed, and I didn't have the time, is that uh, um, the the generacy of confirmation that is uh, produced by this phase transition in the thermodynamic spaces explain the broad variability from cell to cell that you have in those structure of the genome. So uh, we need those concepts of phase transition because in our mind it's how the cell could reasoning to uh, sharply control the confirmation of the genome in different conditions. For instance, if you deplete some agents or not, at least this is what we um, so. And I don't know if this could answer maybe your uh, yes, yes, thank question. you. Uh, so it would be first order for transition in your case. Uh, yeah, I mean, wh why you see this? I mean, just asking because because in that case, then you can test that there the is hysteresis, right? Yeah, 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 sure. Okay, thank you. Thank you. There is another question from Rosario, it seems. Yes. I mean, from from my old uh, knowledge about DNA, especially in eukaryotes and human, you know, uh, genes are organized in introns and exons. When you say gene, uh, is gene is just the complete uh, um, ensemble of introns or it's a single intron? Yeah, <laughs> this is a very good question and I didn't reach this type of details. Uh, and uh, actually, you are totally right. There is a partition within the genes. There are introns, there are exons, there are problems related to splicing and so on. Uh, I, I'm referring to the whole gene body, actually, because now the recent literature is showing that uh, uh, we, we can measure also those maps or contacts for the single gene. And so we are studying also the single structure of the gene. And so what matters is basically now the entire gene body. But this is very local specific. It's very dependent on the situation because there are some genes that are very short, other that are very long. And so for very short gene, uh, of course, it's 
maybe not so important the distinction between intronic and exonic parts, whereas for very long regions, the genes where there are much more interspersed regions, there could be much more important, for instance, the, exo the uh, exons part. But now in this very simplified picture, I was referring to the entire gene bodies without entering in this yeah. difference between introns and, and exons, but you're right. So still now, uh, I mean, people are, uh, it's it's very local specific the importance of one or the other specific subregion of the genes. There is no a clear unified view also on the functions in this. And another question is, I mean, in your type of uh, representation in terms of the uh, polymer uh, with the string and, the, and binders, uh, yeah. the, the unit uh, that you are using in your simulation, how many base pair are, are uh, covering, let's say? I mean, because I don't yeah. think it's a single base pair, right? No, 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 no. Of course, you are right. This is a coarse grain model. So this means the each monomer uh, just uh, cover, say, uh, roughly speaking, like 10 KB or uh, also 5 KB, which means uh, uh, 5,000 base pairs. So it's not one base pair. This is a coarse grain model. In each of these bit order of magnitude, you may have like 5 or 10 KB. Of course, when you do real modeling, we can... Uh, with, with high precision, map those, uh, say, model units in order also to best match real data. And so to answer the question is coarse grain model, order of magnitude 5, 10 KB, mm -hmm. which is 5,000. And have you have any idea of the type of the different binders or not? Yes. Yeah. Yes, this is the last point that uh, really this was a, a rush, I know. Uh, what is the meaning of the binders? Of course, the idea in our model is that the binders are those molecular protein that can bridge the interaction, okay? But what they are, I mean, uh, the, the answer is not easy, unfortunately, it's not trivial. Uh, and what we do is the following, to understand what is the nature of the binders. So we take the profile of the binding sites predicted by the theory for some specific, uh, say, modeling. The, for instance, we took the green binding sites, and we compare, we correlate the position, the profile of those binding sites with the experimental profile of some known binding molecules available on the chromosome that we are studying. And what we find is that each of these colors is associated not only to one specific protein, for instance, CTCF or coasin, but with a specific combination of factors. So, for instance, the green binding sites are the binding sites not only for the coasin, but of also for this other protein called CTCF, for some histone modification like A4, M3, and so on. If you take the red profile, again, you find another different but specific combination. So to answer your question, there is a specific combination of binders associated to the binding sites. And those binders, just to give you the idea, are both proteins, such as CTCF and coasin, or the polymerase, so POL2, also transcription factors, also histone marks modification. Okay. So there is a specific combination of binders mapped into molecular factors. Okay, thank you. Thank you for the questions. Okay, uh, any other question? It seems no. Okay, so I think we can thank again the speakers, both of them. We close the session.